Okay, it's time to begin Unit 12A, which is the um, <clears throat> fluid dynamics. Dynamics, of course, as you know, is motion of fluid. And so we begin with fluid flow rate. Uh, if we take a certain volume of fluid passing a certain cross-sectional area in a certain time, that's the flow rate. We use the letter Q for the flow rate. <laughs> and so flow rate is volume per time passing a certain cross-section area. So if you take a, say, a picture here, there's a cross-section area. The amount of fluid that passes that in time, which is the uh, cross-sectional area times the velocity, that's that volume, and then you can write, well, that's volume per time, if you, uh, because this is length per time. Length in delta t is v. So this is length times delta t, velocity is delta x delta t, times delta t uh, gives you the velocity, so the delta t cancels out of the bottom, and you can write either this, or you can write that, where a is the cross-section area, and v is the average velocity, uh, uh, average across the area of this cross-section area. And what only thing that really matters, by the way, of this area is the reason why we say cross-section is it's the area perpendicular to the flow. That's the part that matters. So we only care either the area perpendicular to the flow or the flow perpendicular to the area. So normally it's easier to just say, okay, well, pipes this way, there's the area. And then we only take the vertical portion of that area to get the flow through that. This is roughly like taking only the force in a certain direction when you're doing work and the, the distance along a particular direction. Or it's like um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the potential energy is only you know, within certain directions. So this is, again, the velocity perpendicular is the only part that matters because any velocity that's along the area doesn't really get it through. So it doesn't really count. <clears throat> and so you break it into perpendicular and in the plane of the area. We don't care about the plane of the area velocity. It doesn't get it through the pipe. So ignore that. It doesn't have any length in a delta t. So these are our basic flow equations. Again, this just describes the motion. It doesn't really tell us about uh, you know, why things move or how that we need energy or F equals ma for. This is more just about describing the motion, but like the kinematics. <clears throat> okay, but we still can use this to solve certain types of problems, though. And uh, a good problem to start with is this one here. It's qualitative. And so tube flow, uh, fluid flows through a tube um, <clears throat> with varying diameters. And so if we just sort of sketch in a, a cross-section area here, right, that's A1, A1. And over here, you get a A2, which is uh, less than A1. And over here, we get an A3. And A3 is equal to A1, or at least it looks like it is in the picture. I think we can uh, safely assume that. <clears throat> and so uh, now we have to start looking at, OK, well, what's, what's Q? Right. So Q over here is equal to uh, A1 times the average velocity there. Q2 is A2 times velocity of 2. And Q3 is equal to A3 times velocity of 3. Now, uh, if we think about the conservation of material, conservation of the fluid here. And then we say, uh, and we assume that it's not building up, uh, which we usually call incompressible. 
uh, in terms of fluid, because if you can compress, you can squeeze more in the same volume, right? Uh, so if we're not building up, we can't do that. Then you say Q1 is equal to Q2 is equal to Q3. And if that's true, we can just substitute down here. And here's where the utility comes into that equation. A1, B1 is equal to A2, B2 is equal to A3, B3. And if they're all equal to each other, um, the first thing we can see is that um, since uh, A1 is equal to A3, then uh, V1 is equal to V3. And that's because, okay, if you're multiplying, you know, if, if you just ignore this one in the middle for now, look at the two on the outsides, Okay, if A1 is equal to A3, you can cancel them out, V1 is equal to V3. All right, so then we know the answer is one of those two. The next thing we say is down here in the middle, right? If A2 is less than A1, then uh, uh, V2 must be greater than V1 uh, so that, um, uh, you can have the equality holes. In particular, V2 is equal to A1 over A2 times V1. Um, and since V1 and A1 are equal to each other, uh, it's also equal to A3 over A2 V3 because uh, the areas and the speeds are the same in those parts. And since uh, uh, A1 is uh, bigger than A2, then, uh, then uh, V2 is equal to something bigger than 1. and is V1, uh, which means that, of course, that V2 is greater than V1. And so it's also greater than uh, V3. So if you take this thing and you twist it around backwards, you end up with this one right here. And which, and this is almost something you can pick out. You say, okay, well, if there's more area, it's going slower. If there's less area, it's going faster. Uh, more area again, it must be going slower. And so what does that mean? It means uh, it's slower when the area is big, it's bigger when the area is small. So that is our, uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, so here's our relation here. This comes straight from this. And then uh, the equalities up here just give you that. And uh, since the area is the same, you take this and you say, okay, that's bigger than one. And so what's multiplying something bigger than one must be smaller than the other side. Thus, thus that. <clears throat> okay, so that is our, um, our first thing to look at here. And uh, a lot of these things is that... Um, are things you've seen before. Uh, if you uh, if you look in here, if you've ever tried this, as you make the the opening smaller uh, by restricting with your thumb, uh, then it comes out faster. Okay, and this is exactly the same thing, less A, faster flow, or equals bigger V. Uh, you see something similar here, it's deep, A is big, so V is small, it's relatively quiet. <clears throat> right here, uh, less deep, 
A goes down, so the speed up. Now, there's a little bit of a careful point here, is that to speed up, you need Ke. Where is that energy comes from? It has to come from something else, so it's from potential energy. So there's a drop in the water height. Before it falls. So if you look at this, the drop in the water height actually starts right here. Right? This is the region here where you have a uh, lower area. And the drop is at the start of that. And so there's a little, you know, the dam spillway of the dam here. As soon as you get onto that spillway with the areas reduced, right, it's blocking most of the water from going, the water drops down. So if you go next time you're out near a dam, just go look at it. And you'll see the water going down long before it falls off the edge. Why it's going down? Well, that's the potential energy you need to get the kinetic energy to get it to speed up so that you can conserve fluid. Conserving fluid, of course, is the A1, V1 is equal to A2, V2. That's the conservation of fluid that um, you need to have happen. So to get that V, you need to use up some potential energy. And that's what's happening back here. That's where it happens, right there. <clears throat> and then of course it falls off the edge. It starts going faster here because it's uh, even bigger uh, delta PE, so it goes fast enough to make white water here. So, uh, uh, and it goes Ke into, um, you know, heat and mess and so on and sound as it comes off the end. <clears throat> okay, so that's that one. This one here is also quite interesting because uh, as it falls, then you lose potential energy so you gain kinetic energy, so uh, velocity goes up. And uh, as uh, velocity goes up, the area has to go down. And that's why it starts wide and it gets narrower and even more narrower. as it drops down because it has to. Now, once it gets small enough, then sometimes this will break up into droplets. And the reason why it breaks up into droplets has to do with the surface energy or surface tension of the water, which we don't really talk too much about in this course. Um, <clears throat> but it's only important when the surface to volume ratio is very high and this thing is still too thick for that. It's gonna, it will happen further down uh, from this uh, particular sink, if you go far enough without hitting the bottom of the, of the sink, it's tall enough, then you'll start seeing that come in. And it comes in with, you know, jiggles and, and starts waving, you know, in and out and in and out as it falls, and then eventually you just get droplets coming down. And that's, uh, that's also an energy, right? What it means is, so what surface tension is, is it takes energy to create surface. So the more surface you get per volume, the more impact it actually has on what the system does. Eventually, making a little ball instead of a really narrow, long channel going really, really fast is the way to go, and that's what it, that's what it ends up doing. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is a few examples where you can actually pick off in nature uh, what's going on. <clears throat> and so we have then, for an incompressible fluid, uh, the continuity of the fluid, which means conservation of the fluid. Uh, that somehow is called continuity. 
in fluid dynamics. Uh, flows, the fluid valve is faster if the cross-section area of the path is decreased. Right? And this is what we just saw. And you can go out and look at those as you're walking around next time in the woods, staying social distance from everybody else, of course. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, let's uh, do an example that uses that. Uh, water flows to the speed V1 in section one of a tube that has a cross section of one square centimeter, flows to section two, and where's cross section area of 0.5 centimeter squared. So what's the speed of the water as it flows through section two in terms of section one? Okay, sounds like we need a picture. Uh, so it goes down to uh, half the cross section area. So here the a is equal to one centimeter squared. A is equal to, put a one on that. Two is equal to 0.5 centimeters squared. And we know kind of qualitatively that if we V1 here, that V2 has to be longer, uh, V2 faster since a2 is smaller than A1. That we kind of guess already. If we want to put some math behind it, we can write A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. And so we want V2, so we divide both sides by A2, A1 over A2 V1. And you plug in, A1 is one, that's a half. A half on the bottom is a two on the top. 2v1, right? And then you uh, you get answer C. Uh, so here's another case. Look, we're looking for something qualitative here. <clears throat> we're looking for uh, you know essentially half the area. What does it do to the speed? And again, you go to the equation and you work it out. So even if it looks qualitative, don't be afraid to go to the equation. Now qualitatively, oh, you already said V2 is faster, so you can already knock out those two. And then the question is to go up as the square or as linear, it goes up linear. And so that is our answer here. Uh, next, it's time to do energy conservation. What does energy conservation look like in fluids? Well, what energy conservation always looks like to us, I hope, is uh, <clears throat> work non conserving is delta Ke plus delta Pe. And if we have uh, no friction or drag, then work non conserving is just the done work done by the gas. All right, so uh, <clears throat> well, assume we have no friction and no drag. Frictionless fluid, right? There it is. Incompressible means that we have our area thing working. So <clears throat> uh, the work done on the gas, uh, think of the force on the gas times dx. What is that equal to? Well, force is pressure times area times dx. Um, so um, it's pressure times the change uh, instead of just the change in x here, uh, you can write the change in ax if the area is not changing. And a times x is the volume. So p delta v is the work done by the gas. So work uh, non-conserving is, uh, if you say p delta v is the same as delta pv, if the pressure is constant in that little area, uh, then the work done uh, it's work done by the gas, so the work done on the gas has got a negative in front of it, right? Because uh, <clears throat> here, uh, this is the work done on the system by an external force. This is the work done by the gas, not on the gas. On the gas is always negative because 
the change in volume is the opposite direction. Right? The, no, the, uh, the force direction is opposite, is the best way to put it. So the pressure difference is opposite. Right? Because remember, this is the pressure difference and the volume difference. Okay, so put them together. So uh, this is the one we want. And so when we put that over here, we have, uh, again, plug this in, we get this. Now, uh, with a, should be a minus sign out in front of there. <clears throat> uh, there it is, see, that up right down here. And so, um, if we now write either, everything here as final mass initial, final mass initial, final mass initial, put all the finals on one side and all the initials on the other side, and then we change the final to two and the initial to one, we get this equation right here uh, after we divide by the volume everywhere. So you divide by the volume, you get pressure one, okay, the volume's gone. A half m divided by the volume v one squared plus uh, again PE for gravity is mgy, so it's m over v times gy. And m over v's all become rows, and you end off with p1 plus half rho v1 squared plus rho g y1 is equal to a constant. Because it's that was the same thing on both sides. And if you look at this, and you look up here, you say, gee, that's energy conservation, or energy problem. And that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> so this falls directly from energy. That's why I wanted to um, go through this. So you see, this is nothing more than our old friend energy method. Okay, but there's a good consequence to this. If we're at the same height y on both sides, so this goes away, then if you have a higher velocity here than here, then this is a bigger number than that, they're equal. So that means this has to be a bigger pressure than that. So if you have a slower velocity, you have more pressure. If you have a bigger velocity, you have less pressure, comparing two points of the same fluid at the same height. Now that's a pretty important qualitative idea here. And so this is the, the, for the qualitative idea, and the last part is bigger cross-section area, slower flow, less cross-section area, bigger flow here, more speed, less pressure. Why? Because you're taking your energy to make kinetic energy, so you don't have enough potential energy left over to make pressure. Pressure is like potential energy, right? You have a canister full of pressure, it can push out on one of its walls and do work. That's potential energy. And so uh, it may not always, depending on you, if you have an imperfect fluid, you might lose some energy in that process, you stick it over here. Generally speaking, if you have a pressurized container, it can do work by expanding the size of the container. That's what happens in hydraulic cylinders all the time. And so, uh, or steam-driven uh, cylinders for that matter. So uh, this um, is really saying, okay, if you have more kinetic, you have less potential energy. Think of an ideal fluid. If you have uh, uh, least poten less potential energy, you have more kinetic. And then you can also throw in the potential energy gravity in there at the same time. You can almost think of this as sort of spring-like because you have like an air spring, high pressure in it, it's got more potential stored in it, and uh, uh, low you have less, and this is the gravitational. So this is really energy, and if you think about it that way, it's gonna seem a lot clearer in terms of what's going on. Okay, so with that in mind, <clears throat> Uh, where am I? Never mind. mind, let's take a look at this problem. Fluid flows through a tube with varying diameters. What's the pressure like? Well, we already determined um, a few things. We determined in the last problem from AV is equal to a constant. We determined that this V1 is less than V2. And we turned that uh, V1 equals V3 is less than V2. That's what we got on the last problem. But now we can go 
immediately uh, into uh, what's going on here. First, we notice that um, one, two, three are at the same height. Uh, so um, the row G Y's drop out and we're left um, with uh, um, B one plus one half row uh, <clears throat> times uh, Uh, row v squared, right? Um, is equal to um, v1 squared is equal to p2 plus one half row v2 squared. And so we now look at what this is here. And we say if v2 is greater than v1, uh, this is big, this is small, and so that means that that has to be small, and this bigger, or smaller, and bigger. And so that means that P1 is greater than P2. And the same argument you can put in that this is back equal to P3, because P3 has the same velocity as this is also true equal for you know, three everywhere. <clears throat> and so you get P1 is equal to P3 is greater than P2. And so uh, that's what we get. Now notice that this is P1 is equal to P2. Before it was V1 is equal to V2 is less than V3. And because you, this goes opposite, right? More speed, less pressure. Uh, now, uh, they're going slower, so their pressure is greater than P2 here. And we can, we can actually see this um, reasonably, uh, reasonably easily, to tell you the truth. And uh, there's, a, there's a good demonstration that shows that. So I want to I wanna go through that. <clears throat> so let's pop over to... Uh, PowerPoint, and where is my PowerPoint? Here's my PowerPoint. Uh, and so, okay, let's pick up here a little bit where we uh, left off. Um, the, um, sorry, here's what we just had, and brightly in color, that's Bernoulli's equation, and so, Here's an example of uh, the, the three um, uh, the three um, <clears throat> regions that we just sort of looked at, and we found v two is greater than v one by the continuity equation, and by Bernoulli's equation, the pressure is smaller in section two. So, if the pressure is smaller, then it doesn't really draw the water up higher. What really happens? I can't hear you. Okay, what really happens is that the pressure is higher on the two sides and it pushes the water down there and the pressure is lower in the middle and it can't stop it from being pushed up. And so it gets pushed up higher. Because remember, you can only push with pressure. You can't pull. It seems like you can vacuum it up, but really what it is is that uh, higher pressure somewhere else is pushing it in and the vacuum can't stop it. <clears throat> and so uh, the outer sides push it down and it gets pushed up in the middle. And so that's what you think should happen. And this is actually how uh, various things work. Uh, we don't really have cars with carburetors in them much anymore. Occasionally you'll find the lawnmower with the carburetor. Uh, in some old cars, now they have fuel injection. But the way the old carburetors work is like a perfume bottle works or an aerosolizer. You have squeeze that bubble there and air flows and it gets into a narrow region just above where it pokes down into the fluid reservoir. Could be perfume, could be spray paint, could be uh, the herbicides they spray on people's lungs. 
uh, that's drawn up or it's pushed up because the atmosphere is pushing on the outside of the fluid and it pushes it right up into that area. And then that's carried on to a higher velocity and out through a nozzle. And the nozzle atomizes because of the high speed. Again, you go to a narrow thing just as you're coming out. And that means the speed increases. You've got the fluid in there, the speed's increasing, and so everything kind of sprays out and you get it uh, aerosolized. And so, uh, <clears throat> So we get to this problem, and this problem here we're actually going to solve on paper, but before we did that, I was going to hop over to yet another place to show you a picture of something in the real world. And the picture of something in the real world is right here. <clears throat> uh, this is what you call a Venturi tube. Uh, right now it has gas flowing in. It gets narrower in here. Sorry about the resolution, it's pretty lousy. And then it gets bigger again, and this is actual fluid in there, and you see it going up in the middle, down in the sides. And then, of course, the air comes out over there. So this is the experiment uh, that shows the uh, lower pressure in the middle as the fluid is pushed up higher compared to the other sides. And notice one other thing here. Notice how this side is a little bit higher up than that. It means the pressure is a little lower over here than it is over here. Now, why do you think that is? You can pause the video if you haven't figured out yet. Come back when you've got an answer. Okay, you're back. Here's the answer. Energy loss, right? There's friction in here against the walls. You lose some energy, right? And this is an energy formula, remember? Uh, and so if you lost energy, you get the whole equation goes down, so you get um, uh, you get um, uh, less less speed. So that means a little higher pressure. Uh, actually, you get less energy all over the, over the place. So the whole term goes down. You get some more work non-conserving, and so you you um, <clears throat> you have a, a lower pressure for the same. The speed is determined by the area ratios. That's fixed. You can't really live without that but it means that you cost you some pressure because you lost some energy and that's the only place you can really get it. <clears throat> that's what happens in the real world is you actually are going to lose energy and if your velocities are fixed by the areas, then you, you basically, because you can't build up stuff in here by having less kinetic energy, it's shoved out, it's just gonna have less pressure than you thought you would. And that's why this is a little higher than that. Okay, so I wanted to show you a, another case that's similar to this, and that's over here in this chair, in this window. And this is blowing between two sheets of paper. And you might ask, what does this have to do with a Venturi tube? Well, uh, you think of what should happen. If you blow between two pieces of paper, naively think, oh, it might come apart. <clears throat> well, let's see. It's called attracting sheets. So you better think about why. There they are, nice and straight. She blows through the straw, they come together. Now, why, if you're blowing between, doesn't it blow up like a balloon? Well, the answer is because the balloon captures the air, right? Can't go out the other side. So you don't have a velocity, it stops it. Here, if you actually can go out the other side, you have a velocity, and that means you're putting that air, kinetic energy into that air, and if you've got kinetic, it's gonna have less pressure if you didn't give it any other energy some other way. And so, pulls the things together. Less pressure is a force uh, that goes in the change in pressure across the sheets, and the force will make them move, so they go together. Okay, so let's go back and do that example that we saw before, and that's gonna be over here. There's our example, popping into view. At least a little delay should go away in time. So air is blown through the tube, <clears throat> and it gives us some numbers here in terms of uh, uh, the um, the speed and cross section areas and stuff. So let's let's put these onto our diagram. <clears throat> A one is uh, seven centimeters squared. A2 is 0.7 centimeters squared, 10 times smaller, that's quite a bit. The speed of the air in the left 
and right sides of the tube, which are the same, is um, two meters per second. And the uh, if we want to calculate the um, uh, velocity in two, we have to actually calculate that because they don't tell us. V2 is equal to A1 over A2 V1, which is seven over 0.7 centimeters squared over centimeters squared, which cancel out, times uh, two meters per second, which is equal to 20 meters per second. So we can then write this as 20 meters per second. And uh, if we take this all to be y equals zero, then everything is at y equals zero, so we can uh, end up dropping the um, <coughs> equation. So let's do a subtraction of Bernoulli's equation. We'll do delta p is equal to p final minus p initial is equal to, uh, in this case, p2 minus p1, which is, and this is Bernoulli coming in here, That's where that equal sign comes from. It equals to one half rho uh, v one squared minus v two squared. You might ask, this is two minus one, why is that one minus two? The answer is we move this to the other side of the equation. And so actually we move the other terms to the other side, whichever way you go. Plus uh, rho g uh, y one minus y two. This has to agree with that because they're still on the same side of the equation. Now this thing here is equal to zero because of this, everything is zero. <clears throat> and so my pressure change then is equal to one half rho V1 squared minus V2 squared is equal to one half rho we're given right there, 1.29 uh, kilograms per meter cubed. And then we have uh, four uh, meters squared per second squared minus 20 squared is 400 meters squared per second squared. And if you crunch this through, you get minus 255 pascals. So that is the change in pressure. And you notice how it goes down? Pressure goes down because it's moving faster. And this tells us just how much it goes down. Now that may not seem like a really big drop for you, but it actually is enough to um, to move some, some things uh, uh, reasonably significantly, if you get enough area for it to, to go across. Okay, so uh, let's um, continue on here. Uh, we have a container, it's full of water. Uh, a hole is then punched into the side of a container 20 centimeters below the top. The size of the hole is small compared to the size of the container. What's the speed of the water as it comes out the hole? <clears throat> and so uh, let's, uh, we need two locations to apply Bernoulli. And let's, um, uh, let's take one just under the surface or just at the surface. Uh, just below the surface. So we wanna be inside the liquid. So it's just below the surface. 
So P1 is equal to P atmosphere. Uh, V1 is about equal to zero uh, since the, uh, the hole is small. And uh, Y1 is equal to H. So we're going to take uh, Y is equal to zero right here. The other one, uh, we want to take uh, right here. Uh, so this is two. Now, if I take a zoom out of this area right here, what is it really going to look like? There's the hull. It's the side of the container. The fluid coming out is really going to look something like this, right? Just like the sink, uh, like the sink and uh, waterfall, it has to speed up, right? And as it does, the the uh, pressure drops. Because the um, in this case the energy is coming from pressure, pressure doing work, and so what we want is to take two right out here, and that's close enough that. Um, That hasn't dropped. So uh, y is equal to zero. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, we still have uh, P2 is equal to P atmosphere. Because it's going to reach atmosphere on the outside of this. Uh, uh, well, it's on the inside. It'll match what is in the atmosphere. Once once it gets out, and you've sort of got it sped up to the right um, to the right speed, and if, uh, so, of course, V two here is what we want, and uh, Y two is equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, now we have what we need for Bernoulli. So push this up a little bit to do Bernoulli. So Bernoulli says that um, P1 plus 1 half rho uh, V1 squared plus rho GY1 is equal to P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho GY2. And this here is P atmosphere. This is zero. This is rho g h is equal to p atmosphere uh, plus one half rho v two squared plus zero. <clears throat> okay, the two atmospheres go, and then the two rows go, and so you get g h is equal to a half v two or v two is equal to the square root of 2gh. Reminds you a little of the kid slide problem, doesn't it? <clears throat> uh, and so let's uh, put in some numbers. The square root of 2, 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, how high are we here? 20 centimeters below, 0.2 meters is equal to about two meters per second. So that's how fast it's coming out. Two meters per second isn't slow, by the way. 20 centimeters? 20 centimeters is, you know, it's, it's like that, right? Uh, it's, and it's going two meters per second. 
And that's, uh, that's a few miles an hour. <clears throat> that's, that's not really that slow. And so the, um, uh, this is really, uh, it's really quite interesting. Now, uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, I should point out, when I said this, it speeds up drop from P. Remember that right in here, uh, P is equal to P atmosphere plus rho GH, right? So we have the whole rho GH to drop to speed the stuff up as it gets out here. And that is um, what's driving the kinetic energy increase to get this out. <clears throat> uh, as we're going. And of course the area decrease here is again as um, uh, A V is equal to constant. So as it speeds up you get less area and then eventually it will stabilize. Until it starts going down it will speed up more and get narrower again. Uh, this is, of course, a nice problem, and as a nice problem, it's uh, it's worth a uh, it's worth a uh, a good um, uh, demonstration. So let's pop over to here again and move to this one. And you get that you can guess what this is going to be, right? <clears throat> uh, so this has got three holes in it uh, here, here, and there. So as you fill that up with blue water, bluer than blue, right? <clears throat> now you wonder why the stuff is coming out. These little things are taped over right now. Now, the one on the bottom should have the most flow rate out. How are you going to tell, right? Projectile motion is how you're going to tell. So the higher it goes out, the further it goes. As the pressure drops, it goes slower and slower. Right? This one hasn't changed a whole lot until it's going to just dribble out just until it stops flowing because there's no water there anymore. And then this one now is finally starting to go to, a, you can, by the projector, see this nice half of parabola there? And it's going to start falling down as, as it gets closer and to a steeper and steeper down until basically it dribbles straight down because it doesn't come out with any horizontal initial velocity, right? That's, uh, that's how why it's a half a parabola because it comes out straight to the side before it starts dropping. So that is essentially what we were looking at uh, in, uh, in real life, as it were. So we'll go back to our camera here and do the next example. And this is the next example. Uh, high winds blow across a house, uh, such as in a hurricane, for example, or a tornado. And you often see roofs lifted off houses because of this. Question, why is the roof lifted off the house? Well, the answer is Bernoulli's equation or Bernoulli's effect. And so let's do Bernoulli. Um, let's take, uh, this says V1. So I'll take point one out here. And so uh, we want to know the pressure. We want the force, right? So the force, we know that force is equal to pressure across the roof times the area of the roof. That's the force on the roof. <clears throat> So we need the pressure on both sides, or actually we just need the difference between them. We don't need to know exactly what it is, but we'll get what it is. So this is point one here, just on the outside. Uh, P1, we don't know. We're gonna have to get that from Bernoulli's principle. V1, we do know, it's 35 meters per second. And uh, Y1 is equal to, let's just call this zero. It doesn't really matter what we call it, y1 is equal to zero. Take point two just inside. 
And now if you think what happens, we go to different y's. Well, for every one just outside, there's a two just in the side. So if we do it for one height, it'll work for all the different heights. You get the same pressure differential. So two is inside uh, P2 is equal to P atmosphere. We're assuming that nobody has done something special. There actually is something you can do, by the way. Um, you can uh, open a window on the other side of the house. So this side, the wind's blowing. You don't really want to do that. You pressurize the house like a balloon because it'll stop on this side. But if you open one on this side, where there's still good wind velocity, then you'll decrease the pressure in the house because the wind's blowing on over this side. It tends to bring the air out. And you can drop the pressure inside and keep your roof from blowing off. <clears throat> I learned that when I was a kid, that that's what you wanted to do. So V2 is equal to zero. We're assuming nothing is moving in here. And Y2 is equal to zero. Okay, so we know everything on the inside. We don't know as P on the outside. And that's what we're going to use to get this done. So, <clears throat> You know, the other way when you say delta P across the roof, where does that come from? If you think of just a piece of roof here, then you have a, a force over here. Remember, it can only push. So this is um, the force of two, right? And that is equal to um, P2 times A. And this is two on this side, remember, can only push. So the force from the inside is actually going that way. And the force from the outside, <clears throat> so this is P2 in here. Out here we have P1. And this is a force of one, which is P1 times A. It's going this way. And so the net force, which is equal to, uh, is equal to, uh, you know, uh, the difference of those two is P1 minus P2 times the area. That would be the outward. If I'm doing P1, um, sorry, it's P2 minus P1. Uh, P2 minus P1 is the outward force. Right, because uh, P2 is one going out, P1 is going in, and so that's out. And that minus makes it in. <clears throat> so if we get a negative number, it's compressing the roof. If we get a positive number, it's an outward force. And so this is where we need Bernoulli. So let's write down Bernoulli. P1 uh, <clears throat> plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho G Y1 is equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared uh, plus rho G Y2. Right, and these are both zero, and uh, the um, uh, V2 is also zero. Those are the same, they drop out, it turns them to zero, that drops to zero. And so we can get um, uh, P2 minus P1 uh, by, uh, It equals um, a half rho v one squared, and let's put that in one half rho we had from. Uh, I think it was the last problem we did, one point two nine kilograms per meter cubed, and it's thirty five meters per second squared, and so that. Um, gives us um, 790 uh, kilogram uh, 
So it's a meter squared per second squared. Kilogram meter per second squared is a uh, Newton. No, it's a um, uh, kilogram meter per second squared is a, it's a Newton per meter squared. And now uh, we need to, which is a Pascal, I suppose. Uh, so now the net force is equal to delta P times A, which is equal to um, the 790 Pascals times the 240 meters squared. And that is equal, if you multiply it out, to 190,000 newtons, which is about 19 metric tons. So that is a lot of force. It's tons of force. So um, this is right around 19 metric tons. A uh, metric ton is a thousand kilograms, or the weight of a thousand kilograms, and so you have to a um, uh, thousand goes out, and then the weights you take out a g, it's about ten. That's why it's an about, and so you get nineteen metric tons. A metric ton is a little bit bigger than an American ton by a factor of one point one. This multiplied this by one point one. If you want the number of American tons, you get about twenty one American tons. Twenty one tons is a lot of force. You can easily lift the roof with that. Of course, 35 meters per second is pretty high. Remember, 26 to 27 meters per second is 60 miles an hour. So this is uh, quite a bit above that. <clears throat> and so, yes, you can lift off tops of houses uh, or roofs rather easily with this. And so let's then go up to our final uh, couple of demonstrations. Uh, these are fun ones. Again, something to keep you busy while you're stuck at home. Um, by the way, this one, we're going to use a leaf blower and a bottle. That might be a little loud inside if you uh, are clamped down. So you can do the same thing with a ping pong ball and a hairdryer. Just don't turn the heat on the hairdryer or you're liable to melt your ball and make a big smelly mess that you won't want to hang around the house with. So I guess you can push this button up here. So if you think about it, the, uh, the <clears throat> fastest velocity is right in the center, right above the leaf blower. And so the, um, <clears throat> The velocity gets smaller out to the sides. Right? The biggest velocity is straight up. Out to the sides, you get a slower velocity, hence a higher pressure. Lowest pressure is right in the middle. And so if you take a look at this, uh, the highest pressure, okay, is the lowest pressure is here in the middle. That's why it tends to sit in the middle. It's uh, lower pressure the outside because you have less speed. It actually uh, gets pushed back to the middle, and that's why it works so easily. Notice how this has water in it. You do add this with an empty bottle, it's going to blow the bottle away. You have to have enough mass, it doesn't. That's kind of the trick of all this. You also have to start it in the middle, it'll get lifted up. Now it'll stay in there. If you do this with a beach ball, if you get a heavy beach ball anyway, uh, it'll sit you know, a fair distance above it and you can move the thing around rather easily because the surface area is pretty large in the beach balls, so that pressure difference is magnified. Uh, but uh, one of these, you know, third half full of liquid is usually pretty good for a leaf blower, in case you want to try that. <clears throat> and here's our final demonstration, a ball in a funnel. Now the key is you put the funnel upside down, you put a ball on it, and when you turn the air on, the, um, that wasn't very, really... Now notice what happens when he turns the air on. You have to watch his finger to see when he's turning the air on, right? He's gonna pull on that. As soon as he pushes that trigger, up it goes. And it stays there because the air has to go 
uh, around the, um, the air has to go just, it's blocked in the middle. So the air has to flow around the edges. If the air is flowing around the edges, it's flowing faster there. So you have a lower pressure around this ring where the air is flowing than you do on the bottom. So atmospheric pressure is pushing up in the bottom. It's lower in this ring around the edge. And so the ball is kept up, held inside that funnel. Now, if you want to try this at home, you don't have to have an air tank around. You can actually blow into a funnel. You stick the the ping pong ball up from underneath and as long as you can keep blowing which you know you could probably do for uh, at least a few seconds uh, that ball stays stuck up there and down as soon as you stop it'll fall out because you don't have that uh, pressure difference from the Bernoulli holding it up <clears throat> and that is the end of our section 12a on fluid dynamics and the end of our lectures for the class so uh, that's it, and we're going to stop this, and now it's time for you to prepare for the uh, well, final exam, perhaps. We'll have, we'll have something on that uh, posted later.